help from Dr. Kantarian. His own men in Kent, like I said, um, crucial for, for this conference to happen. Indeed, as he was crucial for making the first, you know, the first conference in our series of leisure and philosophy project to happen last year. So let's talk about the criteria and talk in the mathematical paradigm, philosophy trades, concept script. Thank you very much, Christine. Well, I've slightly changed the title of my topic. So, um, the main idea here is, in fact, it, um, it was anticipated by a point Hanyu made in his talk, is about the roots of analytic philosophy, where exactly and how exactly uh, did, did analytic philosophy start, and how was analytic philosophy possible to begin with. And if we look today at the contemporary philosophical landscape, we might wonder what those people who consider themselves analytic philosophers would like to define themselves as in terms of which particular criteria of how to do philosophy. So one thing you often hear is that analytic philosophy is argumentative. Well, that doesn't work very well because as we, most of you here very well know, there are lots of arguments in all the non-analytic uh, philosophers, Diltai, Kassir, Heidegger, Husserl, I would say even Hegel, Schell, Schlegel, Schelling, they all are full of arguments. So the argumentative criterion doesn't work. Is it rather that to be analytic, an analytic philosopher is to have precise arguments? Well, that's a matter of taste. If you look at the works of Michael Dummett, Robert Brandon, John McDowell, it's a I think disputable whether the arguments are very precise or not. Christine Wright, for instance, thinks that John <coughs> is not an analytic philosopher. Sorry? He's not an analytic philosopher. Uh, Christine Wright. Christine Wright. So the precise argument, I think, is not very precise itself. What about the fact that to be an analytic philosopher is to be involved in linguistic analysis? There was some truth to that at the beginning of analytic philosophy and up into the 1970s, but from the 1960s onwards, and very strongly so in the 70s and 80s, linguistic analysis turned into a sub-discipline of philosophy, namely into the philosophy of language, and today is very much connected to linguistics, to formal semantics, pragmatics, uh, and syntax. So I think that linguistic analysis is again not a very good criterion to describe today analytic philosophy. What about being scientific as opposed to being non-scientific? Well, if you look at the works of the Neo-Kantians in the 19th century and the beginning 20th century, all of them thought that they are in the scientific business. Or take Husserl, who in fact wanted to repudiate the Neo-Kantians, even though he wrote his very famous essay, Philosophy as Strenge Wissenschaft, so he was definitely believing that he was in the business of science. Again, it's not a very good demarcation criterion, I think, to say that analytic philosophy is scientific. Well, what about the final two possibilities? I hope I haven't left out anything essential, which is formal logic, and the concept or method of analysis. Well, those two ones are, of course, very important. Formal logic is today a sort of paradigm or picture or image as how to do philosophy, analytic philosophy, proper. There is no question about that. But the question is, what is meant by formal logic and how did it emerge to have such an influential role, a paradigmatic and instrumental role? And that connects, of course, to, of course, the concept of analysis, and that brings us into the 19th century. I would like to distinguish here between three types of analysis, as it were. All three were extremely important in the whole history of the discipline, but one of them, especially starting from the 19th century, the first concept of analysis is that of decomposition, of ontological and epistemological decomposition, the analysis of propositions, judgments, contents of perception, uh, con uh, contents of the mind into symbols, right? That's one thing, definitely, that informed uh, um, analytic philosophy, the formation of analytic philosophy. 
The second concept of analysis is that of re what I would like to call regressive progressive analysis, namely analysis understood as a reduction of certain given truths to basic truths, to basic axioms that goes back to Euclid, Euclid of course, and then the reconstruction of a whole domain of knowledge, be it uh, natural science, be it mathematics, arithmetic, of course, in Frege, geometry in Hilbert, uh, from these axioms uh, back on. Hilbert, of course, did not subscribe to the, to the first understanding of analysis. Now, the third concept of analysis would be one which is we are not so aware of, but I think it is part and parcel of uh, analytic philosophy, and that's actually, literally speaking, mathematical analysis. So the discipline, the mathematical discipline of analysis, as it emerged starting from the 16th, 17th, 18th, and then finally in the 19th century, it became uh, a major, major um, uh, field of research in mathematics, and was very much one of the main inspiring sources for Frege's own conception of logical analysis. And that's what my talk is about, so the mathematical paradigm in philosophy and Frege's understanding of it, Frege's concept script. Okay, so uh, I'll try to show you, first of all, going may maybe a bit to some basic uh, features of this mathematical paradigm, that it's a very, very important paradigm from Plato onwards to today. It has been accompanied as philosophers um, for a very long time, and, but it was only starting with the 19th century, and especially Frege and then Russell and maybe Peirce as well, that it came to full fruition and, and blossoming. Whether or not for the good is a different question. All right, so in modern time, the mathematical, mathematical paradigm in philosophy was suggested initially, well, Lulus is actually middle, middle Ages, but in Descartes, Leibniz, then Frege, Russell, and then informal philosophy today, formal epistemology, formal semantics, uh, um, and so on and so forth. The vision behind it is that philosophy stands in some sort of intimate relation with mathematics. But we are not quite there yet. So mathematics has come out, come of age, of course. Kant already thinks that philosophy hasn't quite come come of age yet, and that's maybe because it hasn't yet managed to uncover its own mathematical uh, its connections to uh, mathematics. So here are a few options. One is to say mathematics offers at least a model for epistemic success as a full, full fully constituted scientific discipline. Mathematics can provide certain tools for philosophy, certain inferential, deductive sort of tools, certain types of symbolism. I will come back to that. The method of philosophy, that's a stronger claim to make, in fact is itself mathematical. People like Spinoza, Leibniz, and Wolf especially very much argued um, uh, in favor of this idea, and Kant, for instance, then railed against, against this view, and even a stronger claim to make, and I'm not joking, I have colleagues who think that, I've met people, philosophers, who say that, that philosophy is a branch of mathematics. Who agrees with this view here? Anybody? Okay, well, it's a pity. The weaker form is to say some philosophy is a branch of mathematics. Then, of course, we want to have a story why only one part of philosophy is mathematical and one, why not the other. Of course, there is a counter tradition to this view. Kant, Hegel, some of our heroes, later German philosophy heroes, Husserl, Heidegger, Witt, later Wittgenstein, were not great friends of the mathematical paradigm. Now, why is it that it is a mathematical paradigm? Uh, it's because it provides a paradigm for the conclusive demonstration of universal a priori truths, that we like that, we philosophers. Take the example, the, there is no greatest natural number. Mathematicians can prove that. We would like to have the same, if possible, in philosophy. Mathematics proves complex truths from basic assumptions or axioms step by step, and the proofs can be checked step by step. Then we want to wonder where does this come from, this precision, purity, certainty, universality, and checkability, not a very nice word, of mathematics, so that we philosophers can then adapt it to our own, for our own purposes. Well, one element is, of course, the fact 
that mathematics employs a certain type of language, a certain type of symbolism, a very precise and artificial one. And another element is that mathematics is capable to conclusively prove its theorems because it has a concept of calculations. From axioms, certain rules of inference, we can get to what we want to prove. So, brief uh, historical view, so I will go very quickly through that. Uh, Descartes himself, if you look at his Discours de la méthode from, from 1637, he was ve he's very much impressed there by the evidence and certainty of uh, geometrical proofs, leading through simple steps to most difficult demonstrations, that then causes him, Descartes, to imagine that all those things which fall under the cognizance of man might be mutually related in the same fashion. All those things falling under the domain of human knowledge, you see that's already going in the direction of, of the mathematical paradigm. He then realizes that an advance can be made by combining certain figures of ge from geometry with certain symbols from algebra, and that of course gave him so-called analytic geometry, although he doesn't use this label, you could also call it <coughs> geometrized algebra because he thinks it's really mutual, it goes in both directions. He's here using, by the way, a synthetic method of combining two disciplines. It's going to be important for my argument later on. And this synthetic method can maybe help to solve many new problems. He writes, I was certain by its means to exercise my reason in all things, my mind accustomed itself to conceive of its objects more accurately and distinctly. So while he doesn't really quite buy entirely into uh, the whole package of the mathematical paradigm, he thinks at least that this paradigm offers us philosophers a mnemonic, memory-based type of advantages, and it's an epistemic ideal of certainty. All right? But he doesn't tell us exactly how philosophy can become itself mathematized in one way or another. Moving on now, of course, to the great mathematical philosopher Leibniz. So we had um, very important mathematical progress going on in the 17th and 18th centuries in algebra, analysis, geometry. The concept of, the func of a function becomes very important. Uh, through Euler, for instance, we get the calculus invented, invented by Leibniz and Newton, and Leibniz becomes very interested in logic itself, in formal logic. So he wants to cover a sort, he wants to develop a sort of logic which is much more powerful than Aristotelian syllogistic logic, one which can cover any reasoning based only on the form of an inference, and syllogistic Aristotelian logic is not good enough for that. For instance, it only allows for two premises. Secondly, it only al allows for each premise to consist of simple subject predicate, predicate um, uh, propositions of which only the subject term is quantified, and so on and so forth. That's not good enough for uh, formalizing, of course, mathematical inference. He adopts for his logic various mathematical elements, axiomatics, he allows for plural premises, more than two I mean. He allows for various algebraic elements in his uh, logic. Here to give you just one example, so-called law of hidden potence, conjunction of a concept and A, and concept A gives us a concept A. It's actually important in, in, um, in Boole later and in mathematics in general. He has variable notation in his logic. He allows even for quantification of a concept. That's why a contemporary um, a Leibniz expert, a German guy, Wolfgang Lenzen, describes Leibniz's logic as a second-order logic of concepts based upon a sentential logic, so propositional logic, of strict implication, which means model logic. So, uh, so lo Leibniz's logic was already extremely powerful. It's not true that uh, Frege and Aristotle are the only two great uh, logicians. Leibniz is up there, I think, in this in a triumvirate year as well. Okay, now what about philosophy? So this is all logic and mathematics. Well, Leibniz distinguished on between two types of arts, the, uh, or, or methods if you want. So the ars judicandi and the ars inveniendi. Um, 
So the one, the first one, the RCUD candy is just a tool to check our proofs and demonstrations. No more, no less than that. The Ars Inveniendi, by contrast, is supposed to be some sort of method to derive new truths from already known truths or accepted <coughs> basic truths. So we have either merely a formal testing device or we have a system to derive all truths from first principles, such as principle of contradiction, of sufficient reason, and philosophy. So actually here you can already see how logic connects to mathematics, right? And to a certain understanding of logic as being mathematized itself. So uh, Leibniz argued that really uh, we need a calculus here and a special type of language. The calculus he called calculus ratio inator or philosophicus. But at the same time, we need also a language. We call it lingua caracteristica universalis. That language is extremely important because its symbols are supposed to pick out individual elements of reality, the basic elements, basic ontological elements of reality. Then we can build our propositions and then derive from our basic uh, truths, new truths, in fact, in ideally all truths are supposed to be derivable from that system. And the language so, so by envisaged is a language whose signs are ideograms, <coughs> yes, a bit like hierog hieroglyphs if you want. Their shape displays the structure of their reference. And here is what he thought this calculus and lingua can do. Concerning signs, what is to be paid attention to is their efficiency for finding new truths, which the greatest whenever they express the inner nature of the thing and paint it as it were. Of this kind are the signs employed by me in the calculus. The contemplation of characters will lead us to the interior of things. We could reason in met met uh, metaphysics and morals similarly to how we reason in geometry and analysis. I think some analytic philosophers believe in this dream even today. If controversies were to arise, there would be no more need of a disputation between two philosophers than between two accountants, for it would suffice to take their pencils in their hands, to sit down to the slates, and to say to each other, let us calculate. Yeah. Calculate, everything is then easily solved. Okay. Um, Kant was not a great fan of this model. This is just an interlude. We don't really uh, have to look at that. Uh, however, later in his life, he had a mathematical friend. Trede was he was called, not Frege, Trede. Uh, and he thought that Trede maybe could develop some sort of calculus and lingua characteristica universalis built upon Kant's system of categories in the critical purism. Um, there's an article by Jan Westerhoff uh, fascinating on this topic. Now, between Trede and Frege, we get uh, Adolf Strandellenburg. I, I discussed him already last year. As you see, I managed to mention him again, not a very well-known figure. He writes an essay in uh, 1857, published 10 years later, in which he mentions and summarizes Leibniz's understanding of this uh, great formal language. And uh, Frege, young Frege, picks up this uh, this essay by Trendelenburg and it's very much influenced by it. So what is it, for instance, one thing Trendelenburg says about Leibniz's uh, language, that it is isomorphic. In other words, we can bring the shape of the science into immediate content, uh, contact with the contents of the concept, creating signs which can match the various marks of the concept. So that's the ideographic aspect of it. Then he continues, uh, Trendelenburg, science has already begun, in fact, in particular fields, to create such a concept script. He uses the word himself, the word that Fregeden later uses for his own form language, namely for number words in algebra and higher mathematics. However, Leibniz has two important misgivings about Leibniz's dream. One is that Leibniz's logic or calculus is too simple contains two simple operations to express all possible concept, conceptual relations, including mathematics, and Frege was to pick up on this uh, objection and then develop a stronger, a more expressive language. And secondly, and that's actually a philosophical uh, objection, such a concept script 
would in fact presuppose already analysis and not vice versa. It's not the ultimate tool for analysis. Analysis is more primordial than any formal language could be. I'll come back to this point as an objection to Frege. So, young Frege, he's fully immersed in the cutting-edge mathematical context of his time. Göttingen and Vienna were leading centers of mathematical research in the world in the 19th century. He's, uh, hello, he's very much concerned with the foundations of mathematics, in particular with certain uh, worries in the 19th century, uh, epistemological worries by mathematicians in the 19th century, Namely, uh, they were worried that intuition had crept into their own uh, proofs. For instance, the proof proving that the, par uh, the parallel axiom and things like that. So they were very worried about getting rid of intuition out of mathematics, especially arithmetic. Okay. And secondly, Freg is, of course, very much concerned with the ontological status of arithmetic, with the foundation of arithmetic, namely questions such as what are arithmetical objects, what are numbers in particular. So he's at the same time also much concerned with the progress of mathematics, so his own logical uh, concerns will be to develop a language which not only can match the, um, or, or check the formal derivations of mathematicians and give us an ontological analysis of numbers, but also help us create new and very fruitful mathematical concepts. Okay, so he reads the Mandelbrot's essay by Leibniz. He knows already from people like Kant and Lotze, by the way, a person not at all mentioned so far. We should devote a whole conference to, to, to Lotze, I think. Uh, Oh, you did? Sorry, okay. Good, very good, very good. You'll be invited then. So, uh, uh, formal logic is a pure universal science uh, devoid of intuitive psychological content. So, he sets out then to put arithmetic on a logical foundation, given this Kantian, Lotzian background, with the help of a Leibnizian dream. So, the Begriff Schrift, the famous first piece by him in 1869, he develops there these two ideas, the calculus and the lingua. He sets out to develop, on the one hand, a calculus and a language to display, on the one hand, to display the arithmetical inferences uh, in a gapless way in order to get rid of intuition. Secondly, to reduce them to first self evident, <coughs> purely logical truths, non intuitive truths, meaning not containing any intuition. Thirdly, to display the structure of arithmetic propositions, tell us what they really are about, what numbers really are. And finally, to allow us to build new concepts out of accepting propositions and concepts. Now, you, as you can see, the scope of this type of formal language, of this concept script, is rather very limited. It's precise and limited. That's what he sets, what Frege sets out in the preface to the Begriff Schrift himself. That's what he writes. Um, now, however, one, one very important uh, thing to be now aware of is what exactly is the core idea here of this concept screen? And I claim, and I'm of course not the first one uh, to claim this, people like uh, Bacon Hacker most famously, but also others have claimed that at the core of the Begriff Schrift is really the, the extension of the mathematical concept of a function. That's what it, what's driving the logic of Frege. I'll repeat it. He says it himself explicitly in a shorter essay. The extension of the mathematical concept of a function. He applied, that's what's driving the logic and the formal language and the linguistic analysis of his concept script and that and that's what later gets expanded into a full analysis of language, and I think mistakenly so. So the, uh, he writes, instead of putting a judgment together out of an individual as a subject and an already previously formed concept as a predicate, as traditional logicians have done, we do the opposite and arrive at the concept by carving up the content of a possible judgment in terms of argument and function. 
The tool for that is the function argument recarving, which uses variable notation from mathematical analysis and the concept of a function. I'll show you examples in a minute. In brackets, I've only come across this Mark William Wilson in a fascinating essay in the Frege, com uh, the, sorry, the Cambridge Companion to Frege, also claims that Frege was inspired here by certain techniques of recarving reca geometrical figures. So his function anal analysis decomposition in logic, which is supposed to be entirely non-geometrical and non-intuitive, in fact was in part inspired by certain cutting-edge developments in, uh, in geometry in the 19th century. Okay, now be this as it may, I will now very briefly discuss, uh, introduce this concept of a function. What is a function? It's simply a correlation initially between numbers and numbers. It's a dependable. Okay, so you have an input and an output. You, put, you, you have an input into the function and you get an output. The input is an argument. The, function, the output is called a value. And that's what you essentially get when you have a function. So, of course, every function, function thus understood is extensional, meaning you can have many different inputs, but for each individual input, you only get one output. So it's a many, many to one relation, not a one to many relation. It's very important. Okay, so here is a very simple example x to the power of 2. For the argument 1 gives us 1, for the argument 2 gives us 4, for the argument 3 gives us 9. Yeah, that's clear to everybody. 3 to the power 2 gives 9, etc. Of course, that's different from, a, from this function, 2 plus x. For the argument 1 gives us 3, for 2, 4, for 3, 5, and so on, and so forth. So far, that's just simple uh, mathematics. That's not yet really fragile. Now, what is interesting is that you can then take any particular number and then decompose it using this function argument distinction. So you can give alternative analyses or recarvings of one and the same number. For instance, you can decompose or analyze the number 9 as the value of the function x to the power 2 for the argument 3. Right? But you can equally well analyze it, analyze it as the value of the function 7 plus x for the argument 2. Yes, it's as simple as that. That's why we have alternative analysis here of one and the same given object or content, if you want. How many possible analyses do you have here? Alternative analysis of number 9? Infinite. Infinite, of course. Thank you. Good. Now, now we are moving on to a more the more philosophical uh, aspect of it. Frege thought he can extend this function argument analysis to mathematical propositions first. And if he had stopped there, it, everything would have been fine, but he didn't. So, take, take the proposition 2 to the power of 4 equals 16. That could be decomposed as the function of the argument of the, sorry, uh, as, the, as the value of the function x to the power 4 equals 16 for the argument 2, but it could equally well be decomposed in an infinite number of alternative manners. What are the values of such functions, truth values, today and later Frege, in early Frege judgments, but we don't have to be concerned with that. The next step is now to extend this type of analysis to non-mathematical propositions, to empirical propositions, like Fido is a dog. Can I not see it in the same way? Can I not see Fido is a dog, or rather the truth value of Fido is a dog, as the value of the function is a dog for the argument Fido? I can, why not? Um, in fact, I can do it also with more complicated propositions such as relational ones. Fido chases Fifi. That can be decomposed as the value of the function Fido chases Y for the argument Fifi or in a number of other ways. Now this is all really very important for understanding um, the, the core idea of Frege's logic and logical analysis. So this is giving us then new concepts. Concepts gained through alternative analysis. The concept Fido chases Y, for instance, 
or the concept X chases Y, a relational concept, etc. Um, a binary uh, relational concept, etc. What's the advantage of this type of analysis, you might wonder? Well, in logic, it's very important because it gives us the variable notation, X and Y, that allows for the logical articulation of complex contents, complex substantial structure and propositions, and of course it gives us quantification theory. It allows us then to bind these variables by quantifiers, okay, such as um, here displayed. In fact, we can go even further. We can then apply this function argument uh, analysis also to complex propositions, I mean molecular propositions, such as P and Q in propositional logic, and we can say that the truth value of P and Q is the value of the function P and Q understood as variables for the arguments the true uh, and the true in this case, and the true and the false, etc., etc. Here are a few uh, examples of concepts just for fun, just to uh, entertain you for a minute. Uh, uh, what can we look at? For instance, the first logical law in the Griffith. This looks like mathematics, doesn't it? Um, but it's actually logic. It, it's, a, it's a tautology. It says that for um, if something A is the case, then whatever B is the case, A is nevertheless the case. That's a tautology. And there are other examples. That's quantification over there. So it just means all A's are B's, etc., etc. So his concept script, as you can see, is trying indeed to display in an ideal Matic, so ideogrammatic manner, uh, the idea that um, the structure of the symbol mirrors the structure of what it represents. So you get isomorphism. He thought that the two-dimensional writing space, space is perfect for that. Here is one more, just for fun. This is one very important in the 19th century. It's supposed to express um, it's uh, a certain co a concept, a concept of the continuity of a number. Again, as you see, if you're just using natural language with some mathematical symbols, you get much less complexity than if you are using <coughs> concept script. Now, I think we can distinguish between two understandings here of, um, of regular <coughs> formal language. One is simply to say, yes, we have, here, um, we have here some sort of lingua characteristica and the calculus. Frege says he himself so in the preface to the degree sheet. However, Leibniz were, was way too ambitious, right? So initially for me, Frege, the concept script is just going to be a language for mathematics displaying logical symbols and inferential content. So that's all I'm doing. Just, I'm just building a formal language for mathematics, not for, for philosophy. And, uh, of course, for these purposes, the subject predicate uh, structure of any given sentence won't matter much. It will be just rhetorical. Take a simple example. Fido chases Fifi, for instance. If you transform that from an active <coughs> voice into a passive voice, <coughs> Fifi is chased by Fido, then in Frege's concept script, both sentences would get exactly the same logical analysis because both sentences have exactly the same logical consequences. Okay, and that's all that he cares about in his analysis of language. In paragraph three of the grief shift, he's in fact, he seems to be rather uh, careful. He says, I don't want to reduce meaning, overall linguistic meaning, to inferential content, right? It's just that I don't care about linguistic meaning as a whole. I only care about its inferential aspect. After all, I care about a language for mathematics, and that's what we do in mathematics, we infer. Um, he also says, again, that seems to be a very careful point, uh, I think sometimes overlooked. He says, again, in the preface, that the relation between concept script and natural language is one between a microscope and sorry, uh, between a microscope and an eye, that suggests, of course, that concept script is just a tool. However, we also have bad Frege. Um, 
crawling in to the lines uh, of the Grishri process uh, and so on, he writes, I believe that the replacement of the concepts subject and predicate by argument and function will stand the test of time. That doesn't sound to me as if he is opposed to revisionism. That sounds to me as if he does think that his concept script is unveiling something important and deep about language in general. He writes, um, in fact, in a sense, paying tribute to Leibniz's dream, the immense increase in the intellectual power of mankind that a system of notation directly appropriate to objects themselves would bring about is something possible. He suggests that in that uh, passage. And he continues, even if this wealth goal cannot be reached in one leap, we need not despair of a slow step-by-step -step approximation. Aha, uh -huh. so he's a closet Leibnizian after all, right? He just thinks Leibniz was too quick to, to, uh, to um, pursue his dream, but it's really possible. So, and he writes, he continues, he says, Leibniz's idea, in fact, has been already realized in arithmetic, geometry, chemistry, and now in logic through me, Frege, and indeed, my concept script can connect to hitherto separated fields into a single domain, and we can add dynamics, mechanics, physics, and so on and so forth. What about philosophy? What about the role of concept script then for philosophy and Leibniz's dream? Yes, we can use the concept script also for philosophy. Here is a very famous passage. If it is a task of philosophy to break the power of the world over the human mind, uncovering illusions which, through the use of language, often almost unavoidably arise concerning the relations of concepts, freeing thought from that which only the nature of the linguistic means of expression attaches to it, then my concepts will further developed for these purposes can become a useful tool for philosophers. And I think this is, in a sense, anticipating on telling us in a nutshell the history or the story of analytic philosophy at least in its more formalist or mathematical strand. How much time do I have left? Um, about 10 minutes. Okay, good. In 10 minutes I will give you 12 objections <laughs> to this understanding of philosophy. 15, okay, thank you, Mr. Jones. Well, let's step back here for a second before we become too enthusiastic and uh, recall our friend Ludwig. Der Gruß der Philosophen und einander sollte sein, lasst dir Zeit. This is how philosophers should greet each other, take your time. So let's very slowly look into Leibniz's dream and Freud's possible dream of giving us a formal mathematical means to analyze everyday language. The first, pro the first two problems will be rather general, I think. They don't necessarily apply just to Frege. Um, well, formal logic as it is employed today in analytic philosophy has been employed to formulate theories of language and meaning. Davidson and Dunnett were most famous for that in the 1970s and 80s. They haven't been able to formulate any such theories. And I think the research program has now uh, stopped, really but uh, still important of the ideas uh, are floating around. But the question is whether the concept script can really capture natural language, or even an extension of concept script can really capture natural language. Well, according to modest Frege, concept script is just a tool or instrument for a very specific uh, problem. It's a not, it's, it has a relation between between natural language and concept script that I, the eye has to the microscope. How could it then be that such a specialized instrument could rise to the general task of breaking the power of the world over the human mind? And here I would like to make, if Hanyu can forgive me, a Heideggerian point. You could say, uh, this is from Being in Time, section 69, uh, he talks there about uh, tools, essentially, and he says, look, for something to be a tool, it has to be an abewandtnis. Thank you. It has to be an abewandtnis zusammenhang, meaning in a, what do you call it, in a pragmatic context, yeah? in, a, in a wider pragmatic context. Something cannot be a tool if it's everything, as it were. 
It can only become a tool if it becomes a focal point within a structured life world, essentially. So if we apply this here to this case, then of course concept script presupposes natural language and cannot cover all aspects of it. In fact, it only can cover a focalized partition for it, namely that partition for it for which it has been developed as a tool. Now the second problem, uh, this uh, is uh, nicked from Trendelenburg. I call it Trendelenburg's reversal argument. It's not, in fact, concept script itself which is doing the main job of analysis, if we think here very carefully. It's rather that concept script, being itself an artificial symbolism, needs to be introduced. In order to be able to introduce any artificial symbols into my science, I need to ask myself whether my symbols are adequate, right? whether they are good enough for my purposes. Surely these type of questions can't be solved by translating the questions themselves into some lang formal language and then uh, running some calculus of them. In fact, it's circular. So the questions of whether or not a concept script or an artificial symbolism are good enough must be answered in natural language. There is no other place for that. Okay? So this is what I'm just saying here. And to give you, um, and in fact, even for Frege's specialized case, for, a ma for mathematical content, even there we already must have a good prior grasp of the mathematical content before we can introduce artificial symbols for it. Here is a famous one from the basic laws of arithmetic, uh, cardinal operator. So the number belonging to the concept specified by the extension not being identical to itself, This must be Frege, maybe, from his grave. <laughs> okay, he's unhappy. So, um, so this, this very symbolism itself, for this, of course, the question arises, do the symbols, the primitive symbols in it, ultimately really refer to the right logical simple entity which the number zero is supposed to be? This is part, sorry, so that's part of the definition of zero in, in Frege. And, of course, as I said, we can't just translate this, all this stuff into concepts to, to solve these problems. A third problem, this I have uh, copied from uh, Hanoch Ben Yami's analysis of Frege's logic. Um, Frege seems to have a point that in simple propositions like fiber chase is Fifi, the passive voice transformation, Fifi is chased by Fido is not truth conditionally affected, isn't it? But is that true for other sentences? such as sentences with plural subjects. This is Hanov's own example. I don't know whether it works. I'm a bit uh, unsure about it. But here it is. I leave it to you to decide. Some students attend it every talk. Does that really have the same truth conditions? Or means the same as every talk was attended by some students? Notice that we have here double quantification. Both uh, concept words are quantified. I leave it up to you. But even if Hanoff's argument or example at least doesn't quite work, surely it's not true that passive active voice are not part of a language and only part of pragmatics. But that's just not true, right? Okay, so in other words, two conditions cannot be everything that there is about uh, analyzing the language. Fourth problem. Has the subject predicate distinction been really eliminated? Well, if you look at his concept script, all judgments uh, in it are preceded by this uh, so-called assertion sign, this inverted T. Yeah? That's supposed to express the judgment that A, the judgment itself being an act of assertion. And he says, a language can be imagined, and that is my concept script, with only a single predicate for all judgments, namely, the predicate is a fact. This turn style, assertion sign, is supposed to be this fact. In other words, what this is saying is A is a fact. He gives an example. Archimedes died at the capture of Syracuse. That's supposed to be expressed, if we were to use a concept script version of it, as the violent death of Archimedes at the capture of Syracuse is a fact. That's his version of it, yeah? 
And as you see, this is still in the subject predicate um, of the subject predicate form. And if I get then right, we see that there cannot be any question here of subject and predicate in the ordinary sense. Well, that is true, but no sense? Well, that's not true as you see for yourself. First of all, of course, this supposed new universal predicate Frege has introduced is a fact. It's, of course, still a predicate, right? And it can only be a predicate because it has been imported from natural language. It's relying and sublimating into a new canonical form ordinary subject predicate sentences. So that's already proving the Heideggerian point I was trying to make before. Secondly, if you take A, the, the bit that is supposed to be asserted by saying it is a fact the violent death of Archimedes in our case, A is the nominalization of an ordinary judgment, uh, the initial sentence, transforming subject predicates sentences and uh, sentences of other, of other forms into subject terms for is a fact. Subject terms to which we can then attach the predicate is a fact. In other words, for definite descriptions, such as, for example, this is the violent death of Archimedes is a fact. But, of course, if you see it this way, then the verb or predicate in um, in this definite description is just wrapped up. It's just packed up. It's still there inside the definite description and it can be unpacked if we so want. After all, if it, if it were not the case that the verb were packed into the definite description, then we'd have a problem because that would mean that every definite description in fact can be attached with is a fact. But that's not true. The guy talking to you right now is a fact. That doesn't work. That's nonsense, right? Okay. So not all definite descriptions can be such that they can be um, they can be attached to is a fact. Therefore, there must be definite descriptions which are simply just contorted or uh, uh, or mutilated or uh, condensed versions of proper propositions which contain verbs, and then there are all the other definite descriptions. Hence, I argue, and I've tried to do this in a book I published on Frege last year, it is a myth that Frege has really replaced the subject predicate form uh, with um, argument function distinction for the purposes of analyzing language. And if that is so, then I believe that it's not correct to think that his mathematically understood logic really gives us a tool for analyzing language. Uh, I have a few more points. Uh, okay, oh dear. Contingent propositions. Let's see what I can explain this one. Take the sentence, Socrates is sleeping. Now surely, I hope you'll all agree with me, that I can express this thought independently of knowing whether Socrates is sleeping or not. Right? Surely we can express things prior to knowing whether they are the case or not. Okay, I don't need to check first whether so Socrates is sleeping in order to be able to express that he's sleeping. In fact, that would be circular. However, if Socrates is sleeping, then the truth value of that sentence is the true. Otherwise, the truth value of the sentence is the false, of course, if Socrates is not sleeping. And Frege tells us that the thought, that thing which is expressed by a sentence, is famously the mode of presentation of a truth value. However, we also know that the mode of presentation of the true cannot be identical to the mode of presentation of the false. That's, that's an important um, bit of, of Frege's theory. Uh, when I'm presenting the true, I'm not presenting the same object as when I'm presenting the false. Therefore, my own mode of presentation is not the same in both cases. And uh, if that, however, is true, then it means that when I am saying Socrates is sleeping and he is sleeping, I am expressing the mode of presentation of the truth value, the true. However, when I am saying the sentence Socrates is sleeping and he is not sleeping, I am presenting the mode of presentation of the false. And that's another thought, and that sounds absurd. It is exactly one and the same thought 
and expressing in both cases, isn't it? Okay, there is also an underlying problem, but that's probably going simply too far about his function theory and composition. The sixth problem, and I'll leave it to that, I'll leave the other six points, um, but that is important. I think that Frege here straddled uh, between two different conceptions of analysis. One is the function argument analysis in terms of alternative recarvings of one and the same given content. And the second one is the part whole decomposition, which I mentioned before, and which was part of you know, the traditional understanding of analysis. Now, I claim that these two types of analysis are not compatible with each other, despite heroic attempts by Michael Dunnett's school, Peter Sullivan, and other people. They're all writing extremely complex books and articles and trying to uh, bring together these two paradigms of analysis. I don't think it works. I just give you one, hopefully, not too difficult example. So take the true as the value of the function is a dog for the argument Fido. In other words, Fido is a dog, right? So um, the true is the value of the function is a dog for the argument Fido. Assume that that's the case. Then surely that's not giving us the components of the value of this function. The value is the true. By decomposing the proposition uh, Fido is a dog into into a function and a certain argument, I'm surely not decomposing it into, into its parts. I'm not decomposing the proposition into its parts. Why? Because the true is also the value of the function, the function equals 2 for the argument 1 plus 1, etc. ad infinitum. I can decompose the truth value, the true, in infinitely many ways. How can this ever give me the components, the ontological components of the true, right? Of, of this given logical object. Um, so that's not possible. Therefore, argument function recarving is not the same as uh, atomic ontological decomposition. Okay, so there are more problems. I'll leave them out. Very quickly, just the lessons learned. So the mathematical paradigm, I believe, has had a long tradition in philosophy. It came to final fruition given certain mathematical problems and advances in the 19th century, but also the preceding centuries. Um, and it did so through various synthetic steps. So my claim is Haha, uh -huh. analytic philosophy is really synthetic. Three steps I give you here. First one was Frege's own mathematical logic, which was understood, or is to be understood, as mathematical, as, sorry, as combining mathematical analysis and logic, extending the concept of mathematical function. Second synthetic process is then combining Frege's function, functional logic. Uh, analysis with the ontological paradigm, that's a traditional paradigm of decomposition into symbols. Underpinning this is, of course, the idea that there can be a language which is isomorphic, right? Expresses an isomorphism between language and thought and reality. And then, of course, finally, even so, Frege seemed to, at this modest, Frege seemed to have been quite careful about this. He didn't want one and two to be um, more than a foundationalist project, uh, serving a foundation project for mathematics and arithmetic. However, I think, given the implied generality of his claims and uh, the method, this, uh, this, um, um, this idea has really offered the promise for a finally scientific method in philosophy, analytic philosophy. And I believe that analytic philosophy today Still, to, su to some extent, is following this uh, mathematical paradigm. I'm jumping here, of course, ahead. Um, and I still think that this mathematical paradigm is very strong, and it seems to be hanging full of nice fruits. However, if in Frege, one of the founders of analytic philosophy, this mathematic mathematical paradigm seems to uh, lead to all kinds of problems, especially when we want to study ordinary natural language, then maybe its roots, the roots of analytic philosophy, are not that healthy, and we need to go back to the dark cellar of the 19th century. And take a look there. So, thank you.